realize that a group of people nearly 2,000 years ago sat or stood, I don't know which, and listened to that same reading in some local church. Probably the first reading was in Colossae. And God is the same God today that He was then. And He's still at work, and He causes the sun to come up this morning and to shine on the evil and the good. And He brings His rain on the just and the unjust, and we get to love and worship Him in the name and through the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so this morning, let's turn our hearts to Him. Let's pray again and then look at this passage in more detail. Lord, we're so thankful that in the midst of whatever instabilities of life, you remain stable. You are the foundation of the church. And though you have built it upon and built upon it on yourself, apostles and prophets and all these various parts over these years, yet you stand under and we rest in you. And your word has not failed, it has not changed, and in your gracious providence you have preserved your word so that we have it in very readable and understandable copies, in multiple copies, in various forms, and so Lord we thank you for your word. And I pray that as we read your word we would not be looking at it primarily as something to give us eternal life, but we would be looking at it and reading it to know you, because in you is eternal life. You are our life. You are our joy. You are our hope. And so, Jesus, may today be a day of renewed reminding that you are God and our Savior and our Lord and our Father and our friend and our shepherd. You are the bread of life. You are the water of life. And may we worship you in spirit and in truth by what we think about now, just right now as we sit and hear the word preached. I pray that you would strengthen me to say and express what your word says accurately and faithfully and by the power of your spirit. Change us this morning, we pray, that we may enjoy you more and glorify you better. In Jesus' name, amen. Deciding what to wear can be a big deal. It can take a lot of time, a lot of thought. A lot of emotional energy even sometimes. I mean, we do things like check the weather. Uh, we think about what we'll feel good in when we put it on. Sometimes we have to change because of how we feel once we put something on. Uh, we think about the situation that we're going to be in, the people who are going to see us wear what we're going to wear. And the expression that is famous worldwide, I believe, is, I have nothing to wear as you look in our American closets, closets um, for something to wear. And um, for the guys, though we can say that too, and I've said that many a time, we often say, my favorite shirt is dirty or stained. Now what am I going to do? You know, many of us even have a company dress code. Your company tells you what to wear. You dutifully sign the thing that says to wear this and not wear that. And it rightly guides the choice that you're going to make uh, about what to wear that day. Well, our passage this morning talks about what we wear as Christians. And did you know that the word wear is right in the text? Um, why don't you just glance over the passage again? I'm not going to reread it, but see if you can find it. It's not in that term. You don't use the, he didn't use the term wear, but it's in the little phrase. There are two words and Pastor Eric emphasized them when he read it. It's in the little phrase in verse 10. Actually, it's also in the, in the negative in verse 8, and then in verse 12, and then they repeat it again, even though it's not actually in the text. The translators have added it again in verse 14. You see the little phrase? It's put on, put on. Put on the new self, it says. It refers to putting any kind of thing on oneself. It's just a general term for that. But in particular, or the, the initial or original use of it was in terms of clothing. Clothe oneself in or wear are good ways to translate that term. And so the whole section, verses 5 through 14, teach about being the new you. 
Verses 5 through 11 focus on dying to the old, earthly you. And verses 12 through 14 focus on the positive aspect of the new you. And it uses this image of clothing, what you wear. Therefore, I, we can think of this passage as a dress code for Christians, or what I've chosen to call our new dress code. And so this morning, we're going to focus primarily on what we should wear, but there are two points in this message that I have. Number one is what not to wear, because the passage has that. We're not going to focus on that in great detail because of time, but I do want us to look first at what not to wear. So our new dress code and number one, what not to wear. Look at verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also walked when you were living in them. And so... We're not to wear earthly, immoral passions. Verses 5 through 7 talk about that. Just to summarize it, we're commanded to put to death the sinful use of our physical bodies, including our minds, our senses, especially those related to sexual sin of any kind. The primarily problem, if you'll notice in the passage, with these immoral passions is verse 5. Would you have connected it with that? idolatry. Because if you give in to those immoral passions, you're disobeying God. You're making a God out of yourself. You're choosing to be God instead of Him. God knows that immoral passions in particular make a wreck out of individuals and families. But the real problem is making a God out of our bodies and what they like to feel. So we must not wear earthly, immoral passions. Moreover, we must put off, look at verse 8, earthly, evil practices. That's actually at the end of verse 9. But now you also put them all aside. What? Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another because you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. I'm just going to go through some of these phrases and words. Put them aside as an imperative verb, literally of clothes, as we've talked about, to take off. And then figuratively, because we're not talking about clothing here, lay aside or rid yourself of what? All, it says. It's an all-encompassing word, which means you don't get to make excuses or be selective now in this list. You lay aside, get rid of anger. Anger here is a state of relatively strong displeasure with focus on the emotional aspect. And then he uses another term that's similar, and that's wrath. And that's where that um, intense displeasure, not just strong displeasure, but intense displeasure that reaches that pitch of fury, as we would say. And then malice. You're not to wear malice, the mean-spirited or vicious attitude or even that disposition, kind of similar to attitude, that you could walk around with. And then you're to put off slander. That's the same word that we get the word blasphemy from. It's speech that denigrates or defames. You put that off, he says. Abusive speech. This is speech of a kind that is poor in taste. Obscene speech. Dirty talk. Put that off. And then lying, which is... Simply to tell a falsehood, to tell lies against someone to that person's detriment. So since you laid aside, since you have taken off, you have stripped off the, not just clothes, but these qualities, these aspects of the old man, that which pertain, this old man is what is obsolete. This old self, this old man talks about something that's inferior because it's old, it's out of date. For You, know, you think about, as a Christian, your old life, but, but in the Bible it talks about old leaven, leaven that doesn't work anymore, that doesn't cause the bread to rise. Uh, we think of old computers that are obsolete or worn out. Uh, we think of the old phone in the drawer. The old dress, the old tie, the old TV that you saw at yard sales yesterday, the old antenna 
to the old TV that doesn't work anymore. The old VHS, the old 8-track, the old floppy disk. These are obsolete. These are inferior because they've been replaced with new and better things. It's, old, it's, it's used literally of clothes that don't fit you anymore. Lay those aside. So this is the old self with its practices, all the things just mentioned and more. So in this list, we have our first indication of what kind of clothing or dress the passage is really talking about. It's not talking about the clothes that we picked out of our closet. It's talking about anger, wrath, malice, and all of those are what? Those are attitudes, attitudes of the, not the outside, they're attitudes of the heart. They come from the heart, Jesus said. They are heart issues. They come up and out of our mouths and sadly fit right in with the immoral passions of the human nature that's under sin. So the reason this passage gives for not wearing these things is they don't fit you anymore. They don't fit with your new self. Our new person in Christ doesn't fit into those obsolete clothes of anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech. But as long as you're still on the earth, you have to not only recognize that reality, but you actually have to act according to it. You have to choose to get rid of those clothes out of your wardrobe. Those cannot be, must not be options for your spirit. Your new dress code forbids them. You've probably seen the boy or the man who's wearing a shirt that's three sizes too big for him, or the pants that are two sizes too small for him, or that outdated outfit, and you just go, oh, somebody help the poor individual. <laughs> so if you have a, a, a good mom nearby or a, or a wife, she helps you realize that those don't belong in your wardrobe anymore. I know that was your favorite shirt since elementary school, but you can't wear it anymore, husband. No matter how good it still looks to you or feels to you. Now, and, and the kind of clothes we're talking about here are not the kind that you, <laughs> I have a couple stacks like this, um, that you keep around because um, you might fit back into them someday. That's not, the, that's not the kind of clothes that we're talking about in this passage. The wardrobe items mentioned in verses 5 through 9 are the kind that you have to do what to? Do you notice at the very beginning? You die to them. You remove them completely. You don't keep them around for some day that you might feel like putting them back on. So, if you explore the wardrobe of your life, well, wait a minute, what if you let me come and look at the wardrobe of your life? Well, what would I still find hanging on the closet or hanging in the closet? And maybe do you have some hidden closets in your heart, in your life? Some attitudes that you're hanging on to that you don't want to admit to anyone and you work really hard to pick out different clothes when you're out or here with us. But at home, there's a closet you go and put stuff on all the time that you would be embarrassed or ashamed to let some of us know about. Now, this so far is only what not to wear. What, what, what are we supposed to wear? What are we supposed to put on? Well, verses 10 through 14 tell us what we are to wear. This is the positive part of your new dress code. And number one, it's the new Christ-like image, not new as in something you and I come up with in the 21st century. This is new as in compared to your old self. This is Christ-likeness, the Christ-like image that God has given us. Look at verse 10. And you have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created you. This is a renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free men, but Christ is all and in all for every true believer. Jesus then is the model, the pattern, and the trendsetter for our new dress code. So it says to put on the new self. This is pertaining to being superior in quality. This isn't so much something that's new 
in time, but something that's new or superior in quality. And he says to be, it says being renewed. I'm glad he says that. You're not done yet. You're being renewed, continually being made new. We've not reached the final state of our new self. Your new self is being renewed. The new us ruled by Christ is progressively being renewed day by day, the Bible says. And where is it headed? To a true knowledge. This is a genuine, a real recognition of God in Christ. And it's according to the image. That's the word we get, icon. It represents something else in terms of basic form and features. The Christian is being formed day by day with the features of Christ. The attitudes of Christ. Let this attitude, this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's being formed and shaped in your new you day by day. And this person that you are being shaped into the image of, it says, is our creator. He's the one who created not just our physical bodies, but he created the new you. He makes us with the desire and the ability and, and the certainty the Bible hope of becoming like him. And this happens to every kind of Christian. There are no distinctions. There are no barbarians, as it were, in the church. No, none of these non-Greeks, this de derogatory word that they used for foreigners. There aren't any foreigners amongst us. There are no Scythians in terms of Christ being formed. This is a, these were people that lived in the region of the Black Sea were frequently viewed as the epitome of unrefinement and savagery. There are no such in the church. There, there, are no, um, there are none outside of Christ and all that he is doing. Christ is all and in all. He is the hero of all Christians. He's the idol of all believers. He's the one we want to be like. These verses present to us a whole new model, a whole new icon, to use the word that's there, for our lives. Our new self has Christ as our king, he is our dress code, and we are progressively becoming like our king in his form and his features. And it happens by always increasing in the, this is beautiful, look at the passage, always increasing in the true knowledge of Jesus. Christ is our new identity. Our identity is not an ethnicity. It's not a skin color. It's not a nationality. It's not a family. It's not wealth. It's not positions. It's not occupations. It's not possessions. It's not anything other than Jesus. Did your mom ever get you something to wear and you said, but Mom, please don't make me wear that. It's not in, it's not in style. Nobody else is wearing that. My mom used to tell me, I don't know if some of you moms have done this, well, you can start a new trend. <laughs> that was never encouraging. Um, oh, I'd so much rather look like someone I admired, or at least like everybody else. And sometimes I would, trend, I would try to wear the silliest things if that's what my idol or friends were wearing. Well, as a new creation in Christ, our trend setter, our catalog model, showing us what new clothes you ought to buy, our celebrity, our friend to copy is Christ. And he's not the popular one on the earth, is he? So we have to be willing to stand out, to start a new trend. And that's our calling. We must purpose in our hearts that we're going to follow him no matter what anybody else wears in their attitudes, in their words, and in their actions. We are going to follow Jesus. We're to wear the new Christ-like image that God has made us part of rather than our old Adamic, our old identity like Adam, the fallen, sinful, rebellious man, but what does this look like specifically? Give us some concretes, Paul. Would you help us out? Well, look at verse 12. It starts with the heart Jesus had for others. Where? Not just him generally, but the heart that he had for others. Look at this in verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, 
holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. As those who have been chosen of God, this is that term that refers to those whom God has selected from the generality of mankind and drawn to himself for salvation. And these people are holy. They are pertaining to being dedicated or consecrated to the service of God. They are beloved. This is the same, this comes from that word agape that we're familiar with, to have a warm regard for, an interest in someone. We're God has a warm regard and interest in you. You're his beloved. You're his set apart for his service. And so as that one, put on, take on the characteristics, take on the virtues and the intentions, uh, by your intention, a heart of. This is kind of a graphic term that we don't like to talk this way, but in the ancient world they did this. Um, I'm not even going to pronounce this real well, but it's real picturesque, so I'm going to try Splogsnon. Ew, it kind of, it's kind of onomatopoeic. It, it sort of sounds like what it's talking about. The inward parts, the intestines. The inward parts of a body, especially those intestines which the ancient world, they, they were used to that to talk about the deepest part of your being. We talk about a knot in our stomach. We talk about this feeling kind of sick in the pit of our stomach. He asked David last Sunday how he was feeling. He said, I got a, I'm just kind of sick to my stomach a bit. That, that deep feelings and emotions. Um, we, thankfully, use more terms like heart and, and cleaner, but that's kind of, anyway, it's picturesque too. Um, we don't use the word bowels in polite society, but it was used for the source of genuine love, sympathy, and mercy. It really hits you deep. And so this is that heart of what, though? Where, where, what's hitting you deep? Compassion. This is a display of concern over another's misfortune. A heart of compassion is almost always connected with concrete expressions of this compassion. It, it's fascinating. Did you know that that's the word? This word compassion is the one that's used in Romans 12:1, in view of the mercies of God, in view of the compassion of God. Well, what's that? It's the gospel. It's everything he talked about in Romans 1 through 11. In view of all of that, that's God's compassion being acted out. The gospel is the life, the death, the resurrection, the, the, re the ascension, the session of Jesus as God. It is God's concrete expression of compassion. And then we have kindness. That's the quality of being. This is not ethereal, guys. This is, this is practical. Kindness is the quality of being helpful. That'll work at home. Helpful or beneficial. Aristotle used it of being readily generous in, in disposition. You're ready to give. You're ready to help. Always ready to help. Put your compassion into action. And you just, you can't uh, just say you care without doing something about it. You can't have this kind of compassion without doing something about it. The kindness is the action of the compassion. And Jesus, as we know, clearly had this. And then it says humility. This is rejecting proud, self-focused thinking and living, self-focused attitudes and putting on a heart of compassion and kindness for others, which fits beautifully with this next word, gentleness. Now this one might be surprising to you too. I love this definition. It's the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. Gentleness. And by the way, you don't pull these definitions out of a hat. These definitions come from studying how these words are used in the Bible in its most close context and then broadening it out, New Testament context, and then you try to go into the Old Testament context and where the Greek translation of the Old Testament and then in society at large. And so... Gentleness is the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. So how does that work? It's the idea of courtesy, of considerateness, of meekness. And meekness could be defined as strength under control and our ego under the control of God's Spirit. And you combine that then, and that really, really helps you when it comes to patience. Do you see that word? In this context, it's most likely talk about, talking about the state of being able to bear up under provocation. You're being provoked, and you, and you endure it. You hold up under that. 
because you're gentle, because you're not overly impressed with yourself and the rights that you have to not be bugged. And so, gentleness and patience. So, if you look back at verse 12, it's like the, the short paragraph that you read before you sign off on your dress code at work. It tells us we have a special calling by God to be His. We're set apart. We're loved. Therefore, we have to consider, we, we need to wear clothes that are in keeping with that, with, with who you really are. And code really isn't the right word, is it? There isn't a law that works for this. But there is an image. There is a model. There are principles. Wear whatever will fit with your calling. Wear whatever will fit with the characteristics of your Creator and your Savior, Jesus. Wear these internal qualities first, and then the external words and actions will follow. But the attitudes and qualities listed don't look at all like the people in your life. I've had people say that to me. Yeah, well, that's not how my mom responded, or that's not how my family does it. We don't talk like that. When, we're, when people step on our rights, um, we tell them so. Well, as much as you love your mom and your dad and your family heritage, they're not your model. Now, we ought to try to be Christ-like models, but they're not your model. Jesus is your model. The attitude of our hearts and the words of our mouths toward others must be more and more the meekness and gentleness and compassion of Christ. And so then we have to wear not only this heart for others, but then the next one. In fact, this, this heart for others that's described really comes out in this next quality. Look at verse 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. I just quit arguing because it's over, man. When he gives you that reason, you're done. We need to wear the forgiveness Jesus had for us. And that looks like bearing with one another. This is to regard with tolerance, to endure, to put up with. I love how the Bible just, by its very commands and instructions, just lays bare your, all of your reasons and excuses. It, it, this is connected beautifully with patience, isn't it? To regard with tolerance, to, to endure, to put up with, and then forgiving each other. This, is the, this comes from the word grace. You've heard of kids named charis, or you've heard of the Greek word charis, Charizomai. This is putting grace into action. Forgiveness. It's to show oneself gracious by forgiving wrongdoing. You know what that assumes, right? It assumes you have something that you need to be gracious about. It assumes that your forgiveness is not deserved, that wrong has been done by the other person, and that we have the right to react to them. They did it. You have, as it were, every human right to react to them. Like God has every right to send us to hell. But the Bible confirms this meaning of forgiving one another and being gracious with the next phrase. Whoever has a complaint against anyone. The point is you have things to complain about. You have been wronged. You will be wronged. You will have stuff to put up with, to endure. You have, it says, a cause for complaint. You can blame them for something. That's the beauty of grace. It's unmerited favor. It's favor that you show to someone else, not because they deserve it, but because God forgave you, so also do you. So just as the Lord forgave you, that's what you do. This is a very high standard. Because, think about Jesus. At the very height of all the blame that could be put upon human nature and human beings on the cross in that very place with all the significance of the cross and the crucifixion Jesus said what he displayed grace when he said father forgive them for they know not what they're doing that's this word and idea of forgiveness 
Being a Christian, wearing your new clothes requires a ton, a ton of tolerance, forgiveness, and grace toward those who you have a legitimate complaint against. We have all kinds of people and all kinds of things that we could blame, hold a grudge, and become bitter against, and many people do. It tears apart families, it tears apart churches, it tears people apart. But Jesus stands as a giant example of forgiveness, and the Lord's Prayer tells us, don't expect God to forgive you if you're not willing to forgive others in this way regardless of your rights or the complaint or the blame you have against them. And so this forgiveness or showing grace to others is vital for peace and joy in, in our homes. It's vital in our church and even at your work. The most important part of this is what we display about the gospel through our forgiveness. We're showing God's grace toward undeserving sinners, which is what every person needs to experience more than anything else. And by the way you forgive, you can demonstrate that grace of God, the gospel of God. You display that good news. In order to do that, it's going to take a lot of tolerance and endurance with immature people and being committed to graciousness with many legitimate complaints. And you do it with humility, not even telling them how much grace you're showing to them. I'm really mad at you right now, and you deserve a whole lot of knocks on the head, but I'm not going to do it. You even can refrain from that by in your heart before God releasing it to, to Him and trusting Him to take care of them and you just love them. Demonstrate grace to them. Like Jesus, rejecting bitterness and anger and malice. Trust God to work in them and show that person grace the way He did for you. Wearing your attitude of forgiveness, this attitude of graciousness all the time, and that'll make you stand out. And what does it mark you as? The grace of God, the forgiveness of God, is the display of what quality of God? It's a display, if you do it, it's a display of your quality, really not your quality at all. It's a quality that Christ alone has. It's, it's a quality, the Bible describes that God is what? He's love. Wearing this attitude as a Christian marks you as one of Jesus' followers because it imitates Jesus' genuine love. You can't do any of this without love. Jesus says that it marks you as His follower, John 13, 35, By this shall all people know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. And not surprising then, love is the last garment, look at verse 14, that we're to put on as part of our dress code. And so we wear the love that Jesus wears. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. This phrase, beyond all things, is that preposition on or upon. It's used as a marker of addition to what's already there. In other words, beyond all these things, not necessarily better than, but on top of, in addition to, or over all of these other qualities, put on love. Now, put on is not in the text. You could read it, but upon all these things, the love. The translators add it because it accurately communicates this is, a, this is an additional thing that we put on. Maybe in here we might, might have needed this this morning. I don't know, some of you might be cold and could have used a coat this morning because it's a little chilly in here. But it could be that idea of a coat or jacket that you put on top of everything else you're wearing. It's the word for agape, the quality of warm regard for and interest in another. And it's called the perfect bond of unity. It's one word that refers to that which brings various entities into unified relationship. Remember the barbarian, Scythian bond and free? I promise you, they did not get along in the early centuries. They fought against each other. They didn't talk to each other. They didn't go eat with each other. They were disunified. But in the church, there's none of that. There's only one bond of unity, and it's love, the kind of love that God displayed in Christ. And I like the way some translations say that it's love that binds all of the other garments, all of the other characteristics together in one display of the image of Christ. So if there's one thing that someone should be able to describe you by, it should be love. 
And part of that love and wrapped up in that love are these other qualities. Okay, now, I don't know, this might be a problem since it's almost 12 o'clock, but, it, or it's headed toward lunchtime, but it's kind of like Southern Californians, we think of you know, the big burritos. It's kind of like the tortilla that goes around all the rice and the beans and the chicken or the beef or whatever you like to put in your burritos. The love here is kind of like the tortilla that goes around the whole thing. You don't have to eat it or think about it but because some, some of you aren't, but, but it gets the idea. Wrapped in love, wrapped in love are compassion, kindness, humility, and meekness. Your whole inner being, your heart, <laughs> your bowels, is covered by love. Your heart of compassion is made out of the fabric of love. Your kindness is woven with the thread of love. Your humility is patterned after the love of Jesus. Your gentleness rolls off the bolt of love. Your patience is stitched together by love. Love is under, it's over, it's through all that you do and all that you wear. Why? Because Jesus is love. He never took it off, and he never put it on. He is love. It was always present in everything he was and he did, because it's who he is, First John tells us. And it's funny, because one of the first things I like to do when I get home, like this afternoon, or from work especially, I like to go change my clothes into something more comfortable. So do you think that is a good illustration of this that he's talking about, our, our new clothes? When you get home, in privacy, away from those crazy dress codes at work or whatever, you put on some other kind of clothing or other kind of attitudes or garments? No, internal, at home, all the time, these qualities are God's qualities for us that we are to put on, that he has given us, that he's working in us from one stage of glory to the next. It's not something, they're not something that you put on and off, as it were, in that sense. The ruling principle that is true all the time and in every situation is love. Do the loving thing and you will fulfill every code that God has. In that circumstance, if you're wondering what to do and what kind of attitude to have, Choose love, and you will fulfill the law. And you will look like these aspects of Jesus' nature. Loving God and loving others will be all the clothes that you need. So, when you stand before your spiritual closet, maybe you can do that in your own mind there this morning. When you stand before and evaluate your heart, when you sit there with your Bible open at home in the morning, and your mind and your mouth are engaged in prayerful peering into the closet of Christ-like garments. Because in a sense, when you read the Word, it's like looking through the wardrobe of Jesus and seeing who He is and what He's like and how He responds and what He would say. What do you find there? What does God say that we must wear today? And it, it starts with who you want to look like, doesn't it? What you wear often starts with who you want to look like. Well, that's true of us as well as Christians. What you choose to wear in your attitudes, in your heart, in your life, starts with who you want to look like. And who is it? Who should it be? It's Jesus. Our dress code has a whole bunch of things that we're not to wear anytime, anywhere. But it also has a beautiful list of great garments to wear at all times with all people. They're garments that we were given, that God's working in us. A whole wardrobe that's part of our selection by God to be His children. It's part of your calling. In your closet, there is a heart of compassion. There is one if you're a Christian. Now it needs to grow, and you ought to wear it more often as it were. But it's there, it's part of your wardrobe, a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. There is, as part of your wardrobe, a bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Not just when, but especially when you have a complaint. These are the same clothes that Jesus wore. Now, he wore them perfectly, with no stains, no wrinkles, no spot, no blemish. 
But really, when it comes right down to it, there isn't a code. There isn't a code that tells you what to put on today. There's just love. That selfless interest and giving and sacrificing for the good of others because, because of the love God had for you that we saw in our hymns or passage somewhere this morning. The offertory. So your dress code is the same one that Jesus had, and it isn't a code at all. It's love. Love your wife. Love your husband as Christ loved the church. Love your children as Christ loved the little children and called them to himself. Love others as Christ loved you. Love them as you love yourself. Now, you know that this will be tested, right? These garments will be tested because as long as you're in this flesh, as long as you're on the earth, you have access to all those old wardrobe items, all, the, all, that old, all those old evil attitudes, all that old evil immorality that's on the earth. You are just as susceptible to that in one sense as any other human being on the earth. And yet, by the grace of God, you have been changed, you've been called, you've been made alive, and you now not only possess, because Jesus is with you, access to all of these qualities, you have them, he's building them, but at the same time, the Bible says you have to choose them, you have to work them out, you have to actively say no to the old you and those angry, malicious, evil thoughts and words, and say yes to those gracious, compassionate feelings and words and actions. Now, lest any of you think that I prepared this recently to make a point to anyone or anything, I didn't. This is, I believe, just right out of the passage, and I prepared it like two years ago, or, yeah, it was a little over two years ago. But God's Word doesn't change, and our need for His truth doesn't change. And so may God work these things in you, and you can't do it by yourself. You know that from, this, from the truth of the gospel. The ability to want and to do His good pleasure, which is described in this passage that Jesus is, comes from God's Spirit, and you not grieving the Spirit of God, and you, by, by reading His Word, by knowing His Word, knowing Him through the Word, and saying yes to Him, that heart of submission, instead of giving in to what you would much rather do, put on that other garment, say that other thing, think that ugly, mean thought, that you are absolutely, you, you have every right to think that because of what they did. Yep, okay, go to court, you could prove your case. The Bible says be gracious, overlook, and love instead. And may Jesus be known, be seen, be heard through you by you doing this. So let's pray and ask for God's help.